We're going to continue with the director's report. We, what do we have next? Uh, temporary regulation? Oh, public forum? Uh, we do, Mr. Chair. We do have public forum. I, I do know there are several folks in the audience who are, are hanging on uh, hanging on the question as to whether this agenda, this next uh, month's agenda in January will include the Wolf Plan uh, final meeting. So I do want to close the loop on that. Mm -hmm. um, sooner than later for the folks who are waiting to hear that and then uh, but we do have three individuals signed up under public forum okay I can proceed with that or did we want to close the loop first let's do okay because I, I guess my vote would be we do it in January and okay go from there that's my vote all right I'm leaning more toward a pause there, there's a, a number of things to, to straighten out in a very short amount of time. I'm leaning toward the pause. Commissioner Anderson? <laughs> well, I guess I would say if it comes before us in January and we're not prepared to act on it, we'll know because we won't pass it. So I'm willing to consider it in January, but I'm also willing to consider that we won't have all of the questions answered at that point. But I won't answer them. All right. We've got a lot to clean up. Uh, there's uh, what seem like minor inconsistencies have to be taken care of. And, and uh, uh, so uh, I would lean towards, towards a pause. I would really like it if we actually had a, and that's probably too much to ask, to have a, a new population number before we acted. But uh, so I would lean towards a pause as well. Okay. Uh, Jim. Well, I, you know, I brought it up. I, I, I'm on when we vote. I want to make sure we've got it in concrete. And this is a dicey subject. Okay. I, I, I just want to be fully prepared when, right. when we cast that vote. Okay. Was, was that was that a pause or a no pad? pause? Commissioner? It's a pause. Okay. okay. Thanks, Rick. All right. So we got five to two. All right. So we will not have it on the agenda in January. Very good. We and, will and continue to work with you on it, and then we'll schedule it at a good time. Yeah, I think in keeping, you know, we, we know that there will be a significant public interest, so we want to make sure we have the bandwidth on okay. the commission agenda to cover that. I know February we do also have the marbled murillette um, decision pending, so, but we're going to have to look at our at our future agenda items and figure okay. uh, figure out which date works best. All right. Okay, with that, Mr. Chair, then we have three individuals signed up under public uh, forum and Chair's prerogative. Uh, Chair's prerogative, we'll, I guess, give them three minutes each, these individuals. All right. So first up. Vice Chair Weber will take that. Name. Okay. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, first. Uh, member up under public forum is Craig Starr. And just I'd remind the commission in public forum is just an opportunity for individuals to address you on topics that are not on the agenda. And of course, the commission uh, cannot take action under the public forum agenda items. So, Craig, go ahead. You got, th I'm starting the clock. You got three minutes. Chair Weber, members of the commission, Director Melcher. My name is Craig Starr. I live at 2105 Desiree Place in Lebanon. I'm here today to follow up on the discussion from your September meeting regarding the inequity of LOP tags for the late archery buck hunt in the Metolius unit. I believe it was Commissioner Buckmaster who stated in September that bow hunters' concerns about the inequity in tag distribution are a social consideration rather than being science-based, and he's exactly right. But that shouldn't be a deterrent to considering those concerns because the LOP program as it exists today, including the three-tiered LOP concept you approved in March that liberalized tags when mule deer populations are in a unit are below management objectives is almost completely the result of social considerations for LOP landowners rather than being science-based. 
The concern about the inequity really first came to light early this year. Uh, when for the first time that I'm aware, we actually saw tag numbers for the LOP tags for the Metolius unit and found that in some years they've exceeded the public tags available by more than 50 percent. Now that that information is out in the open, I think it will become an ever greater issue until you address it. Since the late Metolius hunt was established in 1995, there's been an 84 percent reduction in public tags and absolutely no reduction in LOP eligibility. In 2019, two years from now, it'll take 20 preference points for a public hunter to draw a late Metolius tag. At that point, an LOP landowner will have a 40 to 1 uh, greater advantage in tag distribution over a public hunter and that already obscene ratio will grow rapidly after 2019. Probably by two points, two out of every three years. Uh, Director Melcher made some comments comparing the harvest, public hunter harvest and the Metolius unit to landowner preference harvest. And those comments could imply that the special opportunity hunts were the only opportunity that those landowners would have to hunt. And that's simply not the case. Over 99% of the public hunters who apply for that tag have to hunt some other hunt because they're unsuccessful at drawing that tag. The LOP land, okay, the LOP landowners have exactly the same opportunity to, to hunt other hunts than that particular hunt. Either an over-the-counter tag, which a lot of us do when we're unsuccessful, or uh, apply for a landowner tag for some other hunt. My, my point here today is just to encourage you at your March meeting where you set tag numbers in, for 2018 is to reconsider the concept that your staff presented at your September meeting for limiting tags for those hunts where it's extremely difficult to draw a public tag. When those limits are so strict, limits on landowner tags are absolutely appropriate. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Craig. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Next up then would be, and I may mispronounce his last name, but Steve Godin, the Oregon Coast Anglers. Thank you. That was perfect pronunciation of my last name. Very good, thanks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and uh, Chairman Weber and uh, Director Melcher. Uh, I'm representing the Oregon Coast Anglers, a nonprofit organization uh, operating out of the southern part of the state on the coast. And um, <clears throat> we operate with ODFW on a number of projects, so, and which I'm happy to, to collaborate with and, and to uh, support uh, ODFW and also building, helping to build our uh, fish resource. Uh, I'm here today to um, uh, call to your attention the opportunity to split the central coast sub area for halibut fishing and uh, it's been on the docket for uh, for an opportunity to split this year um, and the southern coast anglers uh, were offered a nine eight or seven percent as a quota for that southern area now the the northern area, which is what we're, we're asking for, would run from Cape Falcon to the north jetty of Florence. And from the Florence north jetty to Humbug Mountain would be the southern area. The southern area was offered 9, 8, or 7 percent. Uh, at a meeting in North Bend, we uh, had about 80 plus people there in support of the split. Uh, there was recognition that the, the alternatives that were presented were not enough quota to support the fishery and that we would be uh, 
basically in, in a dis, uh, <coughs> excuse me we would be in a minus mode for fishing and, and cut ourselves short. We proposed 12 percent with an opportunity to um, adjust that based on performance. So if we were able to catch all of those fish and we cut ourselves short, there might be an opportunity to increase the quota. If we, if we were um, not able to catch the fish, the quota might have been too high. It could have been adjusted, but at any rate, uh, ODFW said that that wasn't something they wanted to do. So we would have been stuck with at 12 percent, which still wouldn't have been enough uh, to keep us going for an, an extended period of time. So the opportunity to increase the quota and to split that season would bring more anglers into the southern coast area to fish. We'd draw more, more uh, opportunities for ODFW to sell licenses, and we would bring more economic opportunity into those coastal ports. So I'm here today just to put that on point. We won't, I know you won't take action until April. I mean, that's the process that you're, that's at least defined and that um, I'd like you to review the information that I've provided that gives you some, I think, some pretty good factual information about the uh, catch rate for the northern coast as opposed to what exists on the southern coast. The southern coast catch rate is, is all predicated on how many days we have to fish. If the northern coast ports catch all the fish, we have less days to catch fish, and uh, the seasons get cut down short, and that reduces the opportunity for bringing in the more anglers, more economic opportunities for the ports, and uh, we think that the split would be good for everybody and good for Oregon. And uh, hopefully, I've said my piece in time. And I thank you for that opportunity. And I will be back in April to readdress this with you. And, and perhaps by then, you'd look at the information I've provided and have some questions for me. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Okay. Thank you, Steve. All right. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, then the uh, last person under the public forum is Jim Coleman. Welcome, Mr. Coleman. Good morning. Chair Finley, Director Melcher, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to be in front of you this morning. My name is Jim Coleman. I live at 125 Shore Drive in St. Helens, Oregon. And I'm here today to try to put some perspective on how the Kitts Harbor Plan salmon recovery plan on the Columbia River is going after our 2017 season. Just a little history. In 2014, there were 70 main stem openings for the commercial fleet, harvesting 98,961 Chinook salmon. That was in 2014, 70 main stem openings. In 2017, there were seven main stem openings, harvesting just 18,984 Chinook. And I'm sorry, I did have a handout. Did everybody get that? So the numbers are there. I won't spend a lot of time on the numbers. And you can, I did that so you can reference them later. Um, so that's the main stem, just seven openings. Um, I also captured all the safe areas, summer, spring, and then fall, and those are all here. And I also, there also is a five-year average for those safe areas to put in perspective of uh, how those safe areas have produced over that five-year period. Uh, spring and summer in the safe areas, 2017 did have a spike of 17,596 over the 9,000 average, five-year average. If you look at the fall, the averages are there. And uh, in 2017, in the fall, there was only 11,000 fish caught in the safe areas, way down from the 20,000 average. Um, safe area coho landings for 2017 were 37,000. Uh, the average, for, as you can see, 57,000. So my point is that we have gone a five-year transition period into this Kitzhaber plan, and these numbers radically show that this Kitzhaber plan is not working for the commercial fishery. There's no mainstem fishery. 
There was no main stem fish, zero main stem fishery in the spring, zero main stem fishery in the summer, and very limited in the fall. So these commercial fishermen that were counting on 2017 as an opportunity to make some money made very little. So, so I'm here today just to keep this on the front burner and continue to push it. I know it's going to be on the agenda in 2018, but uh, I, I really ask you to use adaptive management to get this commercial fishery back to where the Kitsaber plan originated it to be. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Commissioner Akinson. Um, I just have a question for Director Melcher. Um, when are we going to hear the summary from last year um, on the Columbia River fisheries? Uh, yeah, Chair Finley and Commissioner Akinson, I believe that's scheduled for the February commission meeting. Thanks. I look forward to that too. So. Others? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chair, that takes us to the last item under the director's report, and that is in your TAN agenda, you have 13, that's 12 plus one uh, temporary rules. And additionally, you should have a copy of a memo, which is dated today from Chris Kern regarding a temporary rule that was adopted yesterday and needs to be included in this motion. If any of you have any questions on these rules, we'd be happy to answer those or I'll call up the appropriate staff. Do we have the, uh, a, a reference to the one that you we should all have the memo. Oh, oh here it is right yeah, here. Okay. I get it. Yep. Okay. All right. Commissioners, any uh, questions, comments, discussion? I would move that we adopt the uh, 13 temporary rules set forth in the TAN agenda and the emergency rule um, included in the memorandum dated December 8, 2017. I second. Okay, it's been moved by Commissioner <coughs> Weber, seconded by Commissioner Akinson. Commissioners, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Against? Hearing none, it passes unanimously. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes the director's report. And I would remind you that 11.45 in about half an hour, we'll, we'll take our, our break for lunch and okay. also say a few words on dedicating the new Vic Atia fly rod display. Go ahead. Uh, I think, Mr. Chair, I think Commissioner Buckmaster had a question. Oh, Commissioner Buckmaster. Chair Finley, uh, I have a, a request of the director before he ends his report. Um, on November 8th, I attended the, a workshop held by the EPA regarding cold water refugia in Portland. Uh, the main um, uh, Oregon agency that was represented there was DEQ. I became aware of uh, at least a, a couple lawsuits regarding cold water uh, uh, refugia or relating to cold water refugia in the Willamette. Uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, participation by the uh, Department of Ecology in Washington. This all comes back to things that we've talked about in the fall season in the Columbia. Uh, I did note there were three um, ODFW employees on the attendee list. I did not see any of those three. They may have been there, but I did see uh, Art Martin uh, from uh, who was there. So I would ask, uh, with your indulgence, uh, Chair Finley, I would ask the director if we could have a report regard bringing us up to speed on what's going on with uh, uh, EPA, DEQ, cold water refugia uh, in Oregon and how it relates to uh, ODF and W. Uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Buckmaster, we'd be happy to do that. Um, I was not in attendance at the meeting, so I can't give you any direct report right now, nope. but we can certainly put that under a director's report in the future, in the near future. Um, and I would also remind you that following up on uh, discussions from last fall, we will be bringing to you, I believe in March, um, some uh, essentially a, a, a step-down approach to how we adopt uh, 
cold water refugia regulations associated with um, the, the interannual variability in water conditions. So not just a blanket, we're going to close all cold water refugia all the time approach, but here's a step down approach to how we would. Um, well, the level of information goes. that was presented at the EPA workshop was impressive. Uh, the fact that it went way, uh, that it went into the uh, Willamette, and uh, which was kind of new to me based on the discussions we'd had in the fall, uh, just says there's, there's more going on than, than uh, certainly I was aware of, and I, I think the rest of the commission would, would like to hear about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Very good. What, what's, uh, before we docket it for rulemaking, let's try to see if we can send it out to the commissioners to read in advance for comment. Very good. Okay. Mr. Chair, that concludes the director's report. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Commission minutes. What I do with my yeah, that's in. There you are, Mike. Oh. Okay. So, these are, again, Michelle, I want to compliment you on all the revisions you've made in the procedure. Uh, we're going to approve the draft October 13 uh, minutes in December. Wow. Nice. Huh? <laughs> it, it was testing our memory skills when we had you burdened with such a long format. Okay. Any comments on the uh, minutes? One. Okay. Nobody else saw. I was not at said meeting, but I certainly hope it did not adjourn at 10:57 p.m. that night. So that's why I just caught that, but I wasn't at the meeting. I, okay. I dare say it did Damn. not. It was. Well, if you, it was. If you were there, we would have gotten done earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All well, right. Good catch. Thank you. <laughs> the only one not there that caught it. <laughs> <laughs> It just felt like being. <laughs> okay. All right. Do I have a motion? Approve the minutes. Um, I move to adopt the the minutes for the October 13, 2017 commission meeting in Prineville. I second. Okay. It's been moved by Commissioner Akinson, second by Commissioner Woolley. Any further comments? Discussion? Okay. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Mm -hmm. Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, it passes unanimously. With the absence of Commissioner Biddle, I, Mr. Commissioner Biddle has been excused for a family medical uh, emergency, so uh, there are six commissioners present. Okay, ocean acidification on hypoxia council and Oregon Agricultural Heritage Commission appointments. This is Karen Brady. Nellie McAdams. We may ask you to take a break at 11.45. Don't take it personal. We'll, Thank we'll, you. We'll just uh, catch it. Chair uh, Finley, Director, and Commissioners, my name is Karen Brady. I'm the manager of the Marine Resources Program, and I assure you I am going to be brief this morning. Uh, I have a, an issue before you, which you've heard me speak to before, ocean acidification, and in this case, you have the responsibility of appointing two members to the new Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Council, and I will briefly describe why we have that council and the appointments that I'm asking you to make today. So going back to the beginning, um, ocean acidification has become an issue for Oregon, starting with the industry problem of our shellfish hatchery uh, industry being unable to grow juvenile uh, oysters starting in 2007, so I'll note it's 2017, 10 years later, we have really come to understand how big of an impact this is, not only for the oyster industry, but the potential impact for our natural ecosystem 
and fisheries species um, broadly. Um, but that first event in 2007 affected thousands of jobs, affected millions of dollars of revenue, and um, has really jump-started um, the conversation globally about ocean acidification as a piece of our concern about climate impacts. So since 2007, you don't have to read or memorize any of these things, but this just gives you a sense of some of the momentous steps that have occurred in the 10 years since uh, we had our shellfish hatchery um, disaster or failure. Um, we have had a real bonding of the West Coast jurisdictions, um, including Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and California, addressing this issue together and various um, activities in those different jurisdictions to both understand and take action um, on this issue. Most recently, um, the Oregon legislature developed and passed legislation, Senate Bill 1039, to establish the Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Council. Now, Senate Bill 1039 outlines um, the first state policy on ocean acidification, just declaring why this issue is of a concern to Oregon. It forms the OA Council, which is a 13-member body, including representation from the governor's office, multiple state agencies, uh, academic researchers, the Ocean Science Trust, um, and underlined and in bold type here, fishing interests and tribal interests, um, the shellfish industry, and conservation. The bill asks of these council members to make recommendations to the state, to the legislature specifically, in a very broad uh, area, which is, includes scientific research recommendations, socioeconomic impact recommendations, and coordination recommendations among state partners. So fishing and tribal interests um, are the two seats for which you have the responsibility and authority to make appointments, and so I'm here to uh, brief you on the nominations that we have and applications that we have for those seats today. Uh, the fishing representative seat, we had an open public application process that was approximately 30 days. We solicited and received applications from three individuals, uh, Al Pazar, Bob Etter, Robert Vincent. Two of those applications um, have uh, uh, very experienced and well-known commercial um, fishermen um, uh, for the for the both the coastal and even statewide issues on fisheries, um, the tribal representative uh, was was uh, solicited through the Legislative Commission on Indian Services, who held separate discussions with tribal entities in Oregon, and that group uh, forwarded a nomination of a single individual, John Schaefer. Um, who is somebody that I personally in the department has uh, worked with on ocean acidification and shellfish issues in the past. Um, so today I am recommending to you to appoint Al Pazar uh, and John Schaefer as the two representatives for the fishing interests and the tribal representative respectively. Um, and for those of you um, who um, have had a chance to look through the applications, I'll uh, Pazar is a longtime fisherman. He has engaged on ocean acidification specifically. He's the former Crab Commission chair um, and has been an active partner of both our department and uh, federal agencies on uh, different research uh, activities. He has a lot of expertise to provide, and I already gave you a rundown of John's expertise. So that is the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Commissioners, any questions? Okay. Okay. Next one. So, Chair Friendly, members mm -hmm. of the Commission, Director Melcher, Shannon Hearn, Deputy Director here at ODFNW. Nellie is with me today. She's going to cover the Oregon Ag Heritage Program, and then I'll talk about the recommendations that we have suggested for you. Thank you, Shannon, and thank you, Chair Finley, uh, Director Melcher, and members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Nellie McAdams. I'm the coordinator of the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program at OWEB. Um, I want to first thank Shannon and Michelle Tate for all of their help uh, organizing these applications and asking great questions as we've been putting together this commission from scratch. 
Um, the, the commission is uh, the governing body of the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program, which was passed by this last state legislature um, to solve two issues um, relating to agricultural um, lands, one of them being farms and ranch succession planning and the lack of succession plans um, among those farmers. And then the second being the preservation of agricultural land in Oregon for production and for the fish and wildlife habitat and natural resource values that it provides. Um, the program it consists of several grant programs. Those include three voluntary grant programs for uh, farmers and ranchers themselves, um, one for conservation management plans, one for temporary covenants um, to lease uh, development rights, and one for permanent uh, working lands easements uh, that purchase development rights but allow the land to be farmed. It also provides funding for technical assistance for those organizations that hold those plans, covenants, or easements, grants for succession planning assistance, and a study of Oregon's estate tax and its effect on farmers and ranchers' ability to pass on their legacies. That is being done by the Legislative Policy Research Office. This program, um, I should let you know, we only received funding to establish the program, to establish the commission, to do the rulemaking, and um, potentially to do a prospectus round of the grant making. We did not receive funding to actually distribute through the grant uh, process. <clears throat> the commission will um, be managing this program. They will be making recommendations to OWEB's board on the program rules and recommendations on uh, funding decisions for the grant programs once funding becomes available. Um, commission membership consists of 12 members, including one ex officio non-voting member from OWEB's board. And I can go through the list of those members if, if you have any questions, but in the interest of time, two of those in, uh, members um, would be recommended, uh, we're asking that you recommend them today. Um, those members would be uh, having expertise in fish and wildlife habitat um, preservation, restoration, and hopefully the body of regulations um, that surround those. Um, in terms of uh, the commission positions, many of the commissioners applied for multiple types of positions, so maybe um, also a farmer or rancher position or agricultural water quality. Um, we are asking boards to recommend one and only one person per commission position. You're welcome to decide the length of years of the first term of the, these commissioners. As I think you, you know, um, the first terms are staggered. Um, well, one, two, three, and four years in order to allow future staggering. Um, each commissioner may um, apply again for a subsequent four-year commission uh, term. Um, I think one last thing I want you to know is, well, first of all, none of the application uh, applicants on your list have been selected by any of the other boards. LCDC or the Board of Agriculture, so um, know that there are no conflicts there. And um, secondly, these commissioners will be members of a Rules Advisory Committee for the first five months of their service, and they will have a very um, uh, great time commitment uh, during that time, so about six full day meetings in Prineville. And um, all of the applicants have been notified of that time commitment, and they've all agreed and accepted to um, that. So you, you can also be assured that at least the last time that I talked to them, they were all willing to accept that time commitment. Um, there will also be other opportunities for them to serve on the Rules Advisory Committee, on technical review committees, and future positions on the commission. We'll be saving their applications. So with that, I will turn it back over to Shannon. We did receive seven applications that indicated they were interested in these two seats that you can recommend. Um, after coordinating with those other agencies and the applications they had and then doing an internal review, the, the two candidates we recommend to you are Mary Wall and Bruce Taylor. We know Bruce Taylor very well from Intermount Joint West Venture, um, Pacific Flyway Council. Um, he certainly has a lot of expertise in fish and wildlife habitat. He also has very collaborative nature. And then Mary Wall is our second recommendation. Um, we know her very well from the Coastal Multi-Species Management Plan and that collaborative effort. She is also a legacy landowner down on the Elk River, um, part co-owner down there with her family, um, and also has um, an excellent um, track record of working on a lot of initiatives for fish and wildlife habitat. 
So there is a draft motion um, that Annika just put out that corrects the one that you guys have in your packet. Um, it allows that it's a recommendation, not a direct appointment. And it also provides you the opportunity to set the term. Um, as Nellie mentioned, there's a um, one year seat and a three year seat. Do you have that motion? Um, I We're didn't searching see for it. that. We don't have it yet. Here you go. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, we do have one public test comment under this. Yeah. So, so before we vote, we'll listen to our public. No, on the second one, I think. Okay, so just, just to finish off, we recommend Mary Wall and Bruce Taylor. I've spoken with Jim, both of them. Right there, Jim Myron. If you are going to make a motion and recommend the duration of their term, um, having spoken with them, I would I would suggest that Mary go for the one year seat and Bruce for the three year seat. Um, Mary has uh, a lot of projects going on and including um, looking for future opportunities, and so she's very willing to do this for whatever duration you provide but is also willing to consider the shorter seat. Okay. All right, before we vote, we have um, Jim Myron. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Chair Finley and members of the commission, Director Melcher. Um, I'm Jim Myron. I'm here representing the Deschutes River Alliance, Willamette River Keeper, and Northwest Environmental Advocates. I just want to just quickly say that we support the appointments of uh, the recommenda recommended appointments of Bruce Taylor and Mary Wall to, the, to this Ag Heritage Commission. And it would make sense, I think, uh, to, to give Mary the one-year seat and, and Bruce the three-year seat. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I have it down because I have it written if you don't. I got the second one. Second. We could do the first one and then now. Okay. All right. Come on back up. I just want to make sure before we vote that there aren't any questions or comments. Commissioner Anderson and then Commissioner Woolley. Uh, just a quick comment to Karen did not, I don't think, mentioned that. Uh, the department also has a designee on the Ocean Acidification Council and actually has a co-chair position, and that's going to be you, correct? Uh, thank you, uh, <laughs> Chair and Commissioner. Yes, that is correct. I have been given the honor of being Kurt's designee for the co-chair of this council, and Jack Barth from OSU is the co-chair um, for that institution. can't think of a better representative. Okay, just, Commissioner Willie. Just a clarification, uh, maybe for Shannon. So, did Mary Wall request that she only serve for one year, or is that kind of an assessment based on what we know of her other workload? I'm just wondering. Chair Finley, Commissioner Willie, my understanding in the conversation with her was it was an adjustment with workload. She would be happy with the three year seat, but um, they they both recognized when I spoke with them that there is another four-year term possibly if they get reappointment so you, you potentially mm -hmm. be looking at five or eight and really no strong I was going to say I called Mary to discuss that and she was happy with the one year okay, Thanks. okay. all right thank you okay do I hear a motion there's two different ones. In yeah. There. Do you want to separate them or the first? Motion? Yeah, I would defer sure. to the fishing folk. Yeah, uh, great candidates, tough choice for sure. But I'll move that the commission appoint Al Pazar as the fishing representative and John Schaefer as the tribal representative, both to serve on the OAH council for four-year terms. Okay. <laughs> I, can this, I can do the second one. Yeah. Well, we need I'll a second. I will second, second. that. Okay, so it's been moved by Commissioner Anderson, seconded by Commissioner Weber. Um, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, it passes unanimously by the six commissioners present. Okay, move to the second one, Agricultural Heritage Commission appointments. I, just as a comment in going through the applicants, um, 
I'm always struck by the high quality of applicants that we have for these positions. And we're making a choice, but it isn't like it's there's bad choices and good choices. There's only really good choices and really good choices. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, I know both of the, the people that the staff is recommending, and I think they're excellent. All right. Are we ready for a motion? Yes. Okay, I would uh, move to that the commission recommend to OWEB for the appointment of Mary Wall for the term ending in January 1, 2019, and uh, Bruce Taylor for the term ending uh, in January 1, 2021. I second that. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Weber and a second by Commissioner Akinson. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Commissioners, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, passes unanimously by the six commissioners present. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Karen. And Mr. Chair, if um, we're five minutes ahead of schedule, but since we were talking about a hard break at 1145, we could just do that now. And, Let's just slide into it. Um, we, we, uh, after lunch, we are going to have an executive session. So we'll go to a classroom for lunch, and then we'll, after we eat, we'll have an executive session. I did, uh, I mentioned to you earlier today that we wanted to have a, a little opportunity to dedicate our new display. You've seen our new display over here um, embedded in the wall. And uh, this, I have a few folks here that want to say a few words as well, but uh, I wanted to reflect a little bit on the development of this display. We've, we've actually, about almost a year and a half ago, uh, former director Lindsey Ball uh, came to myself and Roy Elliker and a bunch of other folks uh, having seen that former Governor Vicatia's uh, custom-built split bamboo fly rod was going to be up for auction. And he said, uh, I think the direct quote was, we've got to buy that. It's got to be publicly displayed. This thing needs to be publicly displayed. So um, maybe that wasn't a direct quote. Lindsay can correct me on that when he takes the mic. But uh, nonetheless, we, we did secure that rod. Um, in, at the Oregon Wildlife Foundation banquet. And then we spent the last year and a half in, you know, through several fits and starts trying to decide how to display it. Uh, we didn't want it to just simply be a, a rod in a box on the wall. Um, because of Governor Tia's legacy, we really wanted it to be much more informative and um, uh, really um, not only a tribute to the fly rod, but a tribute to his legacy. So. We, we started developing some interpretive materials, and then I handed the project off to um, Mike Harrington when he was on rotation in the director's office, and he and uh, Lisa Evans and Renee Merritt in INE, as well as uh, Jessica Saul, really ran with it, and thus you have this beautiful display here today. Um, and as you know, and I know Lindsay's probably gonna mention, but uh, Governor Atiyah was a great um, advocate for fish and wildlife resources, for acquiring the lower Deschutes for public access and wildlife management. And that's a, an area that you all expanded on two years ago as we acquired the lower Deschutes River Ranch and an additional 11,000 acres um, added to that wildlife management area. So with that, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna save uh, some of the thunder for Lindsey Ball, and then we have Tom Atiyah here, um, Governor Atiyah's son, as well as I believe some other family members. So Lindsay, you gotta take the mic though. We got a mic right here for you. We're on the clock here. <laughs> How much time do I have? <laughs> oh, you got five, 10 minutes, whatever you need. People, do they want this one or that one? Whichever, you can, yeah, that's fine. You can, get, you can face the audience if you use this one. I can do what? Face the audience. All right. I like to see who I'm talking to. I do want to. I do want to recognize an individual that had a very innovative uh, plan to generate 
money for non-game species. Uh, he's sitting over here on the end, and he had Bruce Buckmaster. He came up with a stunning idea about a program called Buckabird. It's all yours now, Bruce. <laughs> You'll have to explain that to him sometime. All right, let's get down to business. The fly rod came up for sale at uh, uh, Oregon Wildlife or Oregon Wildlife Heritage Foundation, and uh, we cabbaged on to it. And uh, there was four of us. We scurried around, and we didn't want to go uh, to someone who didn't really understand um, the history of it and the individuals that were behind that. And so we gathered it up, and uh, of course it was already on the auction block, so it was a public auction, and by auction rules, you have to put that out to the public uh, for auction. And so we had a pledge of $7,000 for that fishing rod. And they let me speak to the audience that night, and then we opened it up for auction. And uh, the four people that were involved in it were pretty serious about making sure that that uh, fishing rod and the legacy of Governor Atia and uh, natural resources would be met. And that night, no one bid against us. And so we made sure that it would be put on display here um, at the Department of Fish and Wildlife here in the commission room. Uh, Director Melcher uh, made that pledge, and certainly, as you can see, he held to his word. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about how the Oregon Wildlife Foundation, or as I still call it, the Oregon Wildlife Heritage Foundation, came about. The shark property on the Lord of Shoots River was coming up for sale. Governor Tia knew about it. He loved to recreate on the Deschutes River and fish. And so he and Pat Amadeo, who was his natural resource advisor uh, for, for the governor's office, were sitting talking about how they could come together with some type of means to purchase that lower section of the Deschutes for the state of Oregon. About that time, Ken Clarkwist came in. He was a commissioner um, for Department of Fish and Wildlife at the time, and they started talking about it. And so Ken says, we should create a foundation so we can do get money donated so that we can eventually purchase that property. And that's how it started. And you have the, the, <laughs> the product of all those efforts by being able to access the Deschutes River as we do today. And, uh, and I think you'll see in the display that uh, Governor Tia was uh, uh, directly involved in that, had his hand on it all the time. Um, the only surviving person of that trio is, is uh, Pat Amadeo. I called her the other day. I hadn't talked to her for 10, 12 years. Um, she and her husband now live in Sonoma, California. They want to come back to Oregon. And she says, do you think you can find some place, some place, something for me to do in natural resources when, you come, when I come back to Oregon? I said, I think we can do that. Uh, so she's going to be coming back, and she'll be another uh, helping hand in how we opportun create opportunities for the people of the state of Oregon. Um, with that, uh, we used to check uh, Governor Atiyah fishing on the river. Uh, this is when I was with the uh, State Police Fish and Wildlife Enforcement. In fact, Captain Samuels uh, checked him a number of times up above the lock gate, um, up in the Deschutes Club uh, area. He was always wanting to know how are things going? What's the resource like? What's the population levels? When do we see another run of, of salmon or steelhead? Uh, what's the counts, you know, upriver on the Deschutes? The gentleman was involved 
in his work. Um, and that, that comes from personal experience. Um, so I think it's fitting that uh, Director Melcher said, we'll put it up in the commission room. Uh, there it is. Uh, learn about it. Learn about what we need to continue to do for our fish and wildlife resources in Oregon. I think it's a, it's a statement and testament to an obligation for what's good for our fish and wildlife resources today. Kurt, did I miss anything? No, just, we just have, let's have a few words from Tom and then we'll call it good. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Tom Atia, Governor Atia's son. And I know he'd be very, very proud to see this display here. Not only does it honor him, but it's very informative. And the public is going to get a lot of uh, good information from it. And just wanted to thank everybody, and particularly the Oregon Wildlife Foundation. And thanks, Tim. Thank you, guys. Tom, uh, we're going to break for lunch here. We hope you'll join us, both both gentlemen. Um, and I'd just like to make a comment. You know, many of us have worked on public education over the years, and it was a great idea to have that visible from both sides. Mm -hmm. You know, when this room is not occupied, it's still visible on the other side, so that was good. Okay, we're going to... Uh, break now for lunch and an executive session so for those of you in the audience we're going to target coming back here at 1 30 so you know how to manage your time phone calls lunch and so forth so um, I'm going to read the uh, statement that we read before we go into an executive session the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission will break for lunch then meet an executive session the executive session is held pursuant to ORS 192.660, parens 2, parens F, and ORS 192.660, parens 2, parens H, which allows the commission to meet in executive session to consider information or records that are exempt by law from public inspection and to consult with legal counsel with respect to litigation filed or likely to be filed against the commission. Representative of the news media and designated staffs will be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to leave the room. Well, you won't have to leave the room, but we will be leaving the room. Representative of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the deliberations during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decision may be made in executive session. At the end of the executive session, we will return to open the public meeting and welcome the audience back. And as again, as I said, that will be at 1.30, approximately. That's our target. Okay? Very good. So have a good lunch break. Okay. Well, we're back in session. Thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to proceed with the uh, published agenda. And uh, we'll begin with uh, Exhibit C, Rogue Spring Chinook Angling Regulations Petition. Kevin Goodson. Good morning, Kevin. Good, morning. Good afternoon. Or good afternoon. Yeah, I had it all in my script to talk about the morning, but now I've got to change it to the afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Finley, members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Kevin Goodson. I'm the Conservation Planning Coordinator in Fish Division. And with me this afternoon up here is uh, Dan Van Dyke, who's the Upper Rogue District Fisheries Biologist. District Biologist. And we're here this morning or this afternoon to talk with you about uh, the Rogue Spring Chinook Angling Regulation Petition. Uh, as you know, the petition was uh, submitted on September 26th by the Curry Sport Fishing Association, Oregon South Coast Fishermen, and Tom Satterthwaite, and was asking for revisions to angling regulations for Spring Chinook on the Rogue River. Specifically, they wanted to, uh, they're proposing to uh, implement a five-year fishery uh, that would allow harvest of wild or unmarked Spring Chinook one month earlier than is currently allowed. 
They also proposed that uh, the information could be gained from that fishery that could be used in the 15-year review of the Rogue Spring Chinook Salmon Conservation Plan. Under the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, the Commission has 90 days to respond to the petition. Uh, this petition will, the 90 days will be up on Christmas Day, so today we are here to uh, get a decision from the Commission on how you want us to respond to this, either to deny the petition in writing or to initiate the rulemaking called for in the petition. A little background on the Rogue Spring Chinook Conservation Plan. It was approved by the Commission in September of 2007. The plan's desired status was to, in, is to increase wild spring chinook or unmarked or naturally produced spring chinook, uh, particularly the early and mid-run components of that uh, population. The early and mid-run components are, the, uh, are composed of older age fish that come back in earlier time that are more susceptible to the sport fishery, so they're a very popular uh, part of the spring chinook run in the rogue. And that early component was uh, most impacted by the completion of the William Jess Dam that created the um, Lost Creek Reservoir. We used a public advisory committee to help uh, develop the plan, and they provided input on the desired status and implementation actions that were in the plan. Um, members of the Public Advisory Committee were representatives of the interest groups that uh, have a desire or an interest in um, Spring Chinook and the Rogue, uh, including members of the groups, uh, some of the <coughs> petitioners as well as some folks you're going to hear from uh, today. Specifically, actions that were identified in the plan called for, uh, in order to try to um, increase the early and mid run components of the uh, population called for um, reducing the harvest on those fish by um, not allowing harvest on the, as the fish first come into the river and migrate up the river. So the lower river would close, was closed to wild harvest until June 1. The mid river was uh, closed for wild harvest until July 1. And then the area above Dodge Bridge is, was closed year round for um, wild harvest. That was, uh, there was also an action that called, that allowed that if uh, run forecast predicted a return that was at or above the desired status of 15,000, that uh, harvest opportunities could be considered. Since the adoption of the plan, um, ODFW has been able to implement most of the actions that we have the, the ability to do on our own or had the staffing to uh, implement including putting in those regulations in place uh, beginning with 2008 fishery. And as you can see from the, the graph on the right here, the blue line is uh, the <coughs> estimate of naturally produced spring chinook in the rogue. Um, since plant adoption, we've seen an increasing trend in the abundance of, of those naturally produced spring chinook. But you'll also notice from the orange line or red line, ooh, that's kind of off the screen there, isn't it? Well, you don't see what's going on in the last couple of years, but um, the hatchery production has been, the survival has been a little more um, variable, and particularly the last several years, um, it's really gone, declined quite a bit, and so now, the last few years, there's been quite a discrepancy between the number of wild fish or unmarked fish that are in the river and hatchery fish that have been in the river, and um, that has led to a lot of anglers catching more wild fish than hatchery fish, and so that created quite a bit of concern and frustration with anglers. And in um, response to that, in May of 2016, ODFW was um, asked to come before a legislative committee hearing to talk about Rogue Spring Chinook, and during that hearing, ODFW committed that we were going to be doing an assessment and a review of the, the plan and the hatchery program to try to see if we couldn't figure out ways to alleviate some of those problems. So uh, Fish Division staff met with the Rogue District Watershed staff in August of 2016. We lined out um, tasks that we saw needed to be taken to uh, be able to do a review of the plan and uh, set out a timeline to do that and have begun, done a lot of work on this already. 
Our plan is to reassess the wild fish status to develop a forecast model that could potentially be used to allow for um, seeing when the wild runs are expected to be larger and then potentially allowing some level of harvest during those time periods. And then also, uh, we've already done a lot of evaluation of the Spring Chinook Hatchery Program in the Rogue and um, have already implemented a number of things to try to, to get the, the product produced out of the hatchery to survive better. And uh, we're just starting to see some returns on those and uh, we're hoping that that uh, will prove successful. So based on the fact that we're already underway with our review, staff is proposing, recommending that uh, the commission deny the petition and allow us to consider the petitioner's proposal as part of the ongoing review that we're doing. And hopefully we will can, can complete that mid-2018. By, by denying the petition, that allows us some flexibility uh, to look at the rogue spring chinook more holistically, look at the fishery, the population of wild fish, the hatchery program, as well as other aspects of the plan and how effective it has been. And once we have, that, have done that, we will then get together with the petitioners as well as other interested parties and share what our review found and any recommendations we have to modify actions. And with that, I'll take any questions you have. Okay. We have some public testimony. Yeah, we do. And, uh, so we'll ask you gentlemen to come back. Certainly. Yes. <clears throat> We're going to ask that you come up in panels of four. And uh, we'll start with um, Tom Salterswaite, Richard Heap, Jake Crawford, and Peter Tronquet. I guess since my name was said first, I will start. That'd be uh, perfect. Commissioner Finley, fellow commissioners, <coughs> Director Melcher, good afternoon. My name is Tom Satterthwaite. <clears throat> I live in Grants Pass, Oregon. And uh, I'm, I'm the primary person who authored the petition and did the statistical analysis that are included in the petition. Now, originally, I was hoping to be able to walk you through some of those analyses, but after talking to people within the last two months since I distributed the petition for, the, for review, which I did to not just local fishing groups, but other interested groups who had participated in the Chinook planning process in the Rogue River Basin, the impact, the, the responses that I got were basically, well, Tom, why are you doing this and who in the world are you? So I need to go over my bio with you to some degree, and I, I'd like to start with that. I was a 32-year employee with ODFW. My entire career was spent working in Southwest Oregon. I dedicated my, my career to trying to help improve information that would lead to better management of fishery resources in Oregon. These are completion reports. This is back before any e-version reports were available that I wrote for the Lost Creek Dam evaluation that was funded by the Corps of Engineers. Lost Creek, as Kevin referred to, is a major dam in the Rogue River Basin operated by the Corps of Engineers. Uh, this project was originally designed to terminate in 86, but I designed a, a study to try and improve rele reservoir releases in relation to salmon production in the Rogue. So the study was extended for another 16 years after that, pardon me, 14 years. So other, uh, other studies that, research studies that I have designed that were funded by agencies and not just ODFW, I, I put together the studies designs, I, I executed and supervised the projects, and then I wrote up the completion reports. These projects that I was involved in quite heavily included the Elk Creek Dam evaluation. Elk Creek Dam was another Corps of Engineers project in the Rover Basin. The Jet Boat study, which the BLM funded because they were being litigated at the time over the issue as far as jet boats impacts on fish. And then finally, uh, the Klamath Mountain Steelhead ESA listing proposal was threatened fish, 
I designed a project to look into what the true empirically based status of the fish would be based upon sampling that we did throughout the eco region. The, the, the point here is that I'd like to make, the primary point here is, is so I've designed four research studies and, and those, all the results of all those studies have been implemented by the funding agencies and there hasn't been one single case where any, the results of any of those studies have been subject to any type of litigation. So somebody thinks there's, there's evidence that I have some idea of what I'm doing when I put together research proposals. And that's a, that's a primary component of this petition. Is a, it is a proposal that's designed to lead to better information so that the Spring Chinook plan, conservation plan that was adopted by two, in 2007 can be improved when it comes up for review in 2022. Uh, I was the, the ODFW lead planner and the primary author that put together that conservation plan. And there's, uh, I'd like to recognize four people here who are involved in, in conservation planning efforts. Two of them, Peter Tronquet, who represented the Native Fish Society, and Steve Byerland, who represented Oregon Guides and Packers. They, they participated in both conservation planning efforts, attending almost a total of 50 meetings. Um, with that being said, I believe, did the commission get a handout? Yes. Can, you, can you please go to exhibit We're, uh, number? Tom, you're out of time. I gave you an extra minute. Then I made the point I wanted to make okay. my primary point. Thank Is you very much. Is this the handout you're referring to? Yes. Okay. Okay. We'll come back to you on questions. <laughs> There's eight of you total, so I'm going to give you all four minutes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, Chair Finley, members of the Commission, Director Melcher, I'm Richard Heap. I'm from Brookings. I'm here today representing the Oregon South Coast Fishermen. We signed on to this petition because we are intimately involved with the agency in far, as far as the implementation and, um, and management of the Rogue Plan, the Rogue Fall Chinook Management Plan as it affects the Chetco River. We did a a lot of experimental work. We put in an acclimation net pen. We instituted a coated wire tag study on the Chetco River to assess the various stocking strategies that were being used at the time with the idea of reducing upstream strays of uh, hatchery fish. The point is that we saw these plans and see these plans as a living document, something that is continually working and we're working hard to test uh, various uh, management strategies to see if we can improve <coughs> Uh, fishing opportunities for the public while still meeting the, the uh, basic pre premises of the plan. Uh, in this case, we saw this experimental fishery as an opportunity to collect data that would reflect against what is already in place to better inform the 15-year process when the state reviews this for the 15-year uh, annual review date. So we supported it for that reason. Secondly, in our part of the world, salmon fishing opportunities are diminishing almost annually. We had no fishing in the ocean this year, very limited opportunities in our bubble season, and our in-river fishery has not been very robust this year. So we saw this as an additional opportunity to provide some oppor new fishing opportunity for our public to access salmon. And in the Rogue River, the spring chinook fishing fishery is major it's it's uh it's almost the equivalent of buoy 10 as far as gold beach is concerned there's a tremendous amount of economic return of the community generated by that fishery and we would like to see some additional opportunity while still recognizing the conservation needs for the fish that are identified in the original plan so for those reasons we'd ask you to support the petition thank you okay. Uh, greetings, Chair Finley, members of the Commission, and Director Melcher. My name is Jake Crawford, and I'm the Southern Regional Director for the nonprofit Native Fish Society. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I've provided some written, uh, some written comments on behalf of the organization, which you should have a copy of. So I won't go through those uh, point by point, but I would like to make a, a couple comments. Uh, first is we, we support the department's recommendation, and we ask that you deny the petition uh, as it stands. Uh, as Tom mentioned, we have a long-standing relationship and interest in the Rogue River and in its Chinook populations. Uh, personally, the Rogue is my home waters. I came up from Southern Oregon to be here as well. And when I look at the Rogue, and I'm really excited about the things that are happening there, 
I also look at it from a regional perspective of other neighboring watersheds. And, um, you know, when I look at uh, just this summer, I went down to the Salmon River in California, which is home to the last all wild population of spring Chinook in the Klamath Basin. And population trends for a lot of these fish are down. And so they recorded their second lowest returns on record. And we come back to the Rogue and we look at the groundwork that's been laid over the last decade, the actions that have been taken by the agency, uh, the commission, and we have a lot to celebrate with the status of the population, but we're not there yet. And we're inching towards desired status and we're trying to get there. Um, but, you know, even though we're on an up upward trajectory, we still have work to do. And in the meantime, harvest opportunity is available. There's 1.7 million spring Chinook hatchery fish that are released annually. Those numbers could probably improve as far as returns, but I think that's a separate issue. So I think, you know, the main point that I want to make is that we need to take a, a, a broader perspective with what's happening right now. Uh, we need more information to look at this proposal. Um, my understanding from the department is that that is ongoing right now. Um, they said that it will be available in 2018. And so we really need to take a look at what has happened on the Rogue, what has been successful, what, what parts of the plan can serve as a model for neighboring watersheds and really look at what are the remaining challenges, what do we need to focus our energy on. And so I think that this approach is not only a responsible way of moving forward with Spring Chinook and the Rogue, but it's a, it's a reasonable request. And so for that reason, respectfully, I ask that uh, the Commission deny the petition today and that we consider this proposal among the suite of other issues that Rogue Spring Chinook are facing during that review. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Yeah, I'm Peter Tronquet. I live at 5730 Southwest Barnacle Court, South Beach, Oregon. So I no longer reside in the in the Rogue Valley, but there's never been a day goes by that I'm not concerned about the Spring Chinook on the Rogue. So I thought I'd, because Jake was so eloquent and so was Richard and Tom about talking about this issue, I thought I'd kind of look at it from your perspective and the questions if I was a commissioner, what I would be asking if I was in your position. I guess um, there's a number of questions. The first one I'd ask is, are the petitioners emphasizing conservation or commerce? Is the next question would be, under uh, ODFW's management of this plan for the past 10 years, are we making progress? Tom says no, we say yes. So that's a question I'd want to answer if I was a commissioner or a director. I say we're making progress also. Um, is, it, is it wise to cherry pick a singular uh, management action like an experimental fishery as opposed to the approach that we took when we implemented the plan or designed the plan? And that would be looking at the four H's and making sure we have a broad spectrum, ooh, a broad spectrum of uh, issues that we consider rather than cherry picking one issue. And I guess the final point that I'd like to make and the one that concerns me is that is the, does the commission when they step into a, a conservation plan that's in progress, that process, when you step into a, a plan like that and you make a modification to it, there may be a very good reason to do it, but you set a precedent. And that precedent, it says to a lot of the folks like myself who was an original member of the committee, hey, I've it really, what you, what, all that work you did, those hours and hours and hours that Tom addressed, that all of us did, are they really meaningful? Do we really, you know, by not following through and letting the people that designed the plan, the decisions were made, the commission at the time, and having to modify that, is that, is that what you want to do? So there's a biologic, biological question you have to answer. Are there definite risks in doing that? And secondly, the social side of it, which is, What's the precedent? And I can tell you already, the ink's barely dry on the coastal management plan that you signed off, and there are already people that are, are pushing the department to add hatchery fish to the limited number of hatchery fish that, we, that, we, that you put into the plan that you agreed upon the pan. So they want to increase that, and that, I don't think that plan's two years old. So that's, that's the risk you take. And so those are, the, those are the comments I'd like to leave you with. Thank you. Okay. Commissioners, questions? Commissioner Ickinson. 
I didn't have a specific question, but I just um, wanted to say regarding this petition process, um, it's important for us to hear from the public and whether we decide to um, authorize this petition or not. I encourage all of you to continue to work with us both in the public forum as well as being involved with those conservation plans um, because you're an important piece of where we go in Oregon with fish and wildlife management. Okay. Other commissioners? Commissioner Weber. Tom, I, you know, we talked on the phone and I've been trying to wrestle with the idea that we have a review that's in process right now. And what you were telling me is that what we, we need to do this so that we can acquire data so that in 2022 we'll have that data. Um, as opposed to waiting until the current review is done. And I was, I'm trying to figure out why we would take this step in the middle of a review um, as opposed to waiting until that review is done. Chair Finley, Commissioner Weber, it's, it's a great question and it's, it's one that should be asked. Uh, if you go to Exhibit 2, which is on page 1 of your handout, if you look at the bottom statement in bold, uh, that addresses the first portion of your question. <clears throat> There's statistical, the power of statistical analysis is simply based upon sample sizes. So the more data you have, the more powerful the statistical analysis, in other words, the greater the ability to detect a change, okay, with a high degree of confidence. If the, if the uh, fishery is implemented in the spring of 2018, when the Spring Chinook Conservation Plan basically sunsets in two, 2022, then there will be five complete years of experimental data that would come in that would allow managers to specifically evaluate what happens when you change the duration of the fishery by one month. What is going to happen to total harvest? Mm -hmm. From my perspective, and I struggled with this issue when I was analyzing the data for the Spring Chinook Conservation Plan, I couldn't make such an assessment. I could not flash make <coughs> such an assessment and pass it along to the advisory committee members and not have a red face. I just didn't have that data. To me, this is given, given, the, uh, given the, the health of the population, the current health of it, that harvest, great harvest restrictions employed within the last few years have not resulted in increased production in the basin, then it seems to me like this is a perfect time to go out obtain that information through an experimental fishery which would allow managers to make a better revised management plan in 2023 when the current plan sunsets. Well, you say the current plan sunsets, but in the material you said it's first significant review. Is it sunset or is it going to be reviewed? Well, that's a good question, uh, Commissioner. Um, the the conservation plan specifically says there should be a five-year review, a 10-year review, and a 15-year review. That's what it says specifically. And then their, their term, the 15-year review, is actually termed the comprehensive review. So the implication, granted it's not written, the implication is, is at that time, ODFW would reassess the status of the population in relation to plan goals, reconvene an advisory committee, and in working with the advisory committee, decide whether the plan needs to go on a different trajectory. And the date, I'm sorry, I have to add one more thing. There's 10 years of, of post uh, conservation, the conservation plan, as Kevin said, was adopted in 2007 by the commission. There's 10 years of data that come in that's at that time. The analysis I did this year indicates the population is not increasing relative to other, when you compare it to three other Chinook populations in the ecoregion. 
if harvest truly was a limiting factor, those numbers should be going up relative to the other populations. But they're not. If I was only able to compare to one, the status of one other population with rogue spring chinook, I would have said this is a tenuous analysis at best. But when three populations, the comparison between three populations are showing the same thing. In other words, rogue spring chinook, wild rogue spring chinook are not increasing relative to those other populations. I've got to conclude that the best data we have, we're looking at right now, indicates that harvest is not a limiting factor. Thank you. Okay, I have a, a question. Peter, um, I was recently down at the mouth of the Klamath River observing 30 to 40 sea lions on the sand and another 10 or 12 chomping on salmon and steelhead in the river. Uh, I understand it's a similar thing in Brookings and Gold Beach. We know we have problems with sea lions at the Willamette Falls and other places. And as I sit and have lunch at the River's Edge in Grants Pass, Oregon, and look out at the flocks of mergansers, and also um, cormorants farther down the lower river, do we have any idea, even anecdotally, what predation impact is having on any of these fisheries? Chair Finley, that, that question comes up at so many of our meetings, and I know that ODFW has to deal with that all the time. From my personal standpoint, I've always looked at, uh, we talked a lot, of, when we built the plan, we talked a lot about predators, especially on uh, uh, migrating wild smolts and, and hatchery smolts and what that might be. From a personal standpoint, I've never put, in my conservation efforts, I've, I've kind of looked at pinnipeds and cormorants as a scapegoat for not dealing with the root of the problem that they haven't been the limiting factor. Now there's, you know, you're gonna hear from Steve who's gonna say, hey, you know, this is a big concern and you probably might have that too. But my feeling is that that's not the basic limiting factor when we talk about runs of uh, salmon or steelhead that are declining. There's, there are others, a root cause there. And not to say the predators don't fit in there, but personally, it's not where I go. Jake, you made a mention of uh, one of my favorite rivers off the Klamath, the Salmon. Mm -hmm. What would you, how would you answer my question? Just anecdotally. Hmm. I don't know how you'd study all this. Yeah, I mean, the, the Salmon is one mm -hmm. tributary within a very large, you know, California's second largest watershed. Uh, it has its own issues that it faces um, as far as probably some of the practices that happen in the river. Um, I can't speak to predation and its impact there, but I, I can speak to my experience of going down to the Spring Chinook Symposium hosted by the Salmon Restoration Federation and talking with local people down there about what's happening to Spring Chinook and Spring Chinook and the Klamath. And, uh, it's a different situation. I think when I tell them about the Rogue and the fact that we have a conservation plan in place, uh, we see numbers increasing or, or not dropping to the 3,500 number that it was at the time of the conservation plan being adopted. Um, there's other people that are looking to try to figure out what's going to happen with the Klamath when the dam removals come out, uh, potentially looking at Spring Chinook and the Rogue. And so I think there's, it's important to have that, that broader regional perspective uh, when talking about this issue. All right, uh, commissioners, any others? Okay. Thank you, panel. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, our next panel is Mark Lottis, Sarah Laborde, Steve Beyer, Lynn, and Conrad Gowell. Reset the clock for four minutes so when the red light comes on, that's your. Apparently, our lights are. Oh, no, is it? All right. Yeah, we're lightless, so. Okay. We'll start with you, Mark. All right, so uh, 
Thank you this morning for, or excuse me, this afternoon for the opportunity to comment on this petition, Chairman and Director and Commissioners. Thank you. Mark Lotus, a Gold Beach resident of 17 years, been fishing for spring salmon on the Rogue River for 44 years. I've been as a original member of the spring salmon conservation plan that they were talking about in the other panel. I'm also president of the Curry Sport Fishing Association, a local group of concerned sport fishers there in Gold Beach that was responsible for starting the Rogue River Salmon uh, Sea Lion Hazing Program there in the Rogue Bay and Estuary that's been highly successful and has been, been running now for over 10 years. And uh, also a member of the Groundfish Advisory Panel. Well, we would ask please that the Commission also uh, view this petition as a um, social aspect as well as the scientific that uh, Tom has pointed out that, uh, that the um, fishing and the take of fish is not necessarily the limiting factor. As we all know, limiting activities and license sales and opportunities are declining in Oregon and particularly southern Oregon and this would allow salmon fishery that has been in decline since the plan was put in place to get another start and have a rejuvenated activity. When you can fish for two weeks, a day a week, and not catch any hatchery fish over a period of that time, when you can go fishing for an afternoon and catch seven wild fish with no hatchery fish, or fish a day a week for two months and not catch any hatchery fish, something's out of balance and the participation is going to stop. Uh, unfortunately, uh, unlike what you might have been led to believe, fishing for spring salmon is not a catch and release fishery. They are not caught very easily and in the manner of which is very conducive to that type of thing. So people need to take, take fish home on occasion to at least continue that activity. Um, what happens is families that would go fishing on an afternoon trip decide to go horseback riding and people that would normally come home early from a winter vacation in Arizona stay there and golf instead of coming back to fish. And so as we see over the last 10 years this particular fishery is declining both in activity and participation and in catch and we would hope that you would view this as an opportunity to jumpstart that and also provide the managers to have added information to make decisions and without having their hands being tied going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Sarah. Hi. Um, thank you, Chair Finley, the director, rest of the commission. Um, I'm Sarah Laborde with Wild Salmon Center. We work on uh, stronghold populations from Northern California to the Russian Far East. And as everyone has said here, uh, the Rogue Spring Chinook population is one of those remaining strongholds. Uh, we don't think that this is the time to have an experimental fishery. We think the timing is off. We um, definitely support that it being part of the uh, department's review. So we recommend that the commission deny this petition. Um, in addition to that, there are two other things that, that come up in this, right? This is a hatchery issue. Our hatchery has, uh, is underperforming, and there's a couple key principles. One, no matter how good the hatchery is, we can't put hatchery management on autopilot. We always have to be looking at it and looking at how you deal with those survival rates. And, I'm, and it's great that the agency did dig into that and is addressing that, but that's a key piece. And the other piece is budget cuts have consequences. And whether it be a mitigation hatchery or a state budget, those have consequences because often what it does is it cuts that middle management layer that actually asks these questions and connects these dots and keeps these programs on play. So it's just this, the importance of this, is this fishery to that community and the, then getting that hatchery production up and, and in sync and back to where it was is critical. And it's a, good, it's a good learning opportunity for all of us to remember those other two pieces. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, Steve. 
My name is Steve Byerland. I'm from Gold Beach. Um, I'm happy to be here today and to meet with you commissioners. The, um, I've been on doing conservation work in the Rogue Basin for 47 years and growing. Um, contrary to maybe popular belief, uh, Peter Trotke and I are friends, you know, <laughs> and we do have the same vision. Uh, it's just how we get there has always, you know, kind of been an issue. Um, I don't know of any um, conservation people that are, uh, whether it's Native Fish Society or uh, wild salmon, that I, I can't think of a time that they would say, okay, let's have a wild fish fishery. You know? um, I think, you know, it's just their opinion, the way they, they move that way. Our hatchery system on the Rogue River is funded by the Corps Engineers. It's, uh, very, it's one of the largest hatchery systems in, in the Northwest. It has uh, stable funding. Uh, it produces the same number of fish year after year. Um, there is a hatchery problem. They had a 70% failure to return at the level it was supposed to be um, in 2015. Uh, and then in 2016, it was 40% below. And it hasn't but one year in the last 10 years hit its goal you know, of what would be produced. And so that has to be addressed separately. But uh, on the wild, I mean, on this uh, experimental fishery, uh, from day one, when we went into the uh, I've been interested in habitat. I know when habitat is right, habitat's improved, habitat is there for the fish, the fish will be there. It's kind of like build it and they will come. You know, the plan we're going on with now that was accepted by the uh, commission uh, in 07 um, has very little habitat work in it. Uh, one of the reasons was that they said that uh, our biggest tributary that is suitable, uh, actually it has about 10% uh, of the wild fish spawn in it and only about a mile and a half of uh, area, about 10% of all the wild fish uh, spawn in Big Butte Creek. Uh, I wanted to open that up to allow fish farther up. I was told it was too steep gradient and the gravel wouldn't hold there. ODFW since then. Uh, since the plan have done study in there and found that the gravel is st sticking and staying. So the habitat is suitable, you know. Uh, but we haven't introduced more fish up there. We haven't pushed for fish to be up there. And without doing this experimental fishery test, we don't know if it's harvest or habitat. So we're going to go for the next five years going on a basis of harvest. I truly believe not much will be accomplished because we don't know if it's habitat and even at the end. And when we get to 2022, we still won't know if it's harvest or habitat unless we do something to find out if that's true. And this gives us thing. I would really like to see ODFW come forward with a plan that would give us the same information doing it another way. We made our proposal how to do it. Um, and uh, um, Commissioner Weber asked about uh, the timing. Well, we would love to have this in the proper timing. This is the third time that ODW has delayed when the uh, review was going to be out, and we didn't have a five-year review. Without a five-year review being moved three times, when we were supposed to bring this forward, I don't know. You know and so that's why the timing is now. And we haven't seen anybody come forward with a scientific response. It's all been conjecture, you know. And we're trying to put a scientific um, position and testing into place. Um, and if they would come through with something scientific that would do that for us and accomplish that, I would probably welcome it, you know. But this is the way we can do to uh, find the information we need. Uh, thank you. Conrad. Chair Finley, uh, Director Melcher, and members of the commission, thank you for uh, hearing our testimony today. My name is Conrad Gowell, River Steward Program Director with the Native Fish Society. I just wanted to echo uh, Sarah and Peter Tronquet and Jake's comments. I think they bring up a lot of good points and agree with many of them, so I won't waste your time um, saying the same things. I think, though, especially that precedent that a 
uh, conservation plan that's been put in place where compromises have been made is then modified through petition is a, a bad precedent to set. Um, I've personally been a part of other plans in other areas of the state, and I trust that those compromises made in that planning process will play out over time. Another point that I wanted to add is abundance is one way to look at uh, uh, fish health, but it's not the only way. And there may be other things like spatial scale and diversity and productivity. Um, the other factors we look at for ESA listed fish that might also be improving over time, and to me those are just as valuable to look at as is the abundance. Uh, harvest is always a question about density dependence. And I haven't uh, seen that analysis done to um, the level where I would be confident that this fishery could take place um, and not impact the stock. Uh, given the uh, history of harvest impacts throughout the state, that is of concern to me. Um, I did want to also add the Native Fish Society in our vision also does believe in uh, native wild fish that are recovered to the abundance of uh, harvestable stocks. Um, I don't think any of our river stewards would disagree with that, and I think it's an important point for people to understand. Um, and then I also just wanted to add, uh, in the coastal uh, multi-species plan, which many of you were familiar with, um, there was a concept in there where we looked at variable harvest levels over time, depending on ocean productivity. And I haven't really heard that concept come up in this discussion and just wanted to, to um, bring that forward because when oceans, ocean productivity decreases, if you have a set level of harvest, that can't necessarily track over time. And um, that was a, a, a component of the coastal multi-species plan that was compromised on and agreed on and I th thought brought a lot of value. I haven't yet seen it implemented but I think it would be valuable to look at that in the 10-year uh, review process, which I understand is coming, and uh, we'll look forward to looking at the data um, in the Rogue as it applied to harvest management. Uh, happy to take any questions, and thanks for hearing my comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gull. Commissioners, questions? Um, Sarah. Would you, uh, I can't remember your position uh, with Washington State. Um, you talked about, uh, about problems with the hatchery. You must have, I think you dealt with that a lot in Washington. <laughs> Would you just share briefly with the commission? Yeah, I had findings. an ex well, findings. Well, um, maybe solutions. <laughs> yeah. it's, hard, it's hard work. Um, I was special assistant to the director with Washington State Fish and Wildlife and was part of their hatchery reform initiative that Congressman Norm Dix funded for um, all of Washington and, and Columbia River. So we looked really, uh, we did the real slog of how do you get your, my word, um, our workhorse hatcheries. Now, I'm taking off my wild salmon center hat and putting on my old state hat and that's what I want um, we we looked at our work our workhorse hatcheries to say um, with hatchery reform and ESA and we were looking at the same issues on the Columbia River how do you get wild fish um, recovered and still have hatchery programs that have enough muscle to really put fisheries out so we uh, so we picked some hatcheries that we really invested in. And Washington's hatcheries aren't managed as well as Oregon's, but, um, uh, but we tried. Uh, so we, we had to go through that real tough piece of um, are you collecting the right data at your hatchery? Are you having the right communications with your hatchery managers? And I know that Oregon is doing those same things. Um, and then are you going to look at it and are you gonna, is it going to help you manage how you go through it? Um, and you try to put um, all of these pieces together and try to get a sense of when you start turning dials, what fisheries are you going to impact um, and, and sustain them and keep them going and hope to get fish off the spawning ground so that you can show good results on that side. But it's really hard work. Um, and. And I'll leave it at that. 
What would we have to do as a commission working with the department to, two of you referenced underperformance of, of, of the hatchery, and I know we don't have an evaluation done, do we, in depth analysis? Uh, well, Chair Finley, we certainly have many, many decades of analysis done as it relates to the core um, funded hatchery programs in the basin. I wouldn't say that we have a comprehensive assessment of, of the most recent issues um, that, we've been, that we've been experiencing with hatchery production in the basin. Okay. Fair enough. And um, Chair Finley, the fact that the that the agency was able to go get the data, look at the SARs, and see and dig into that and find out what probably was causing it shows that they're doing that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you, panel. for staff. Commissioner Buckmaster. Referring to uh, this piece we are given from the proponents of the petition, I was having difficulty understanding uh, throughout this exhibits the difference between when they were talking about wild spring fish and hatchery spring fish or the total of spring fish. Um, it, it, it just became a little confusing. Do you have an idea if we were to approve this fishery, how many wild fish we would expect to be harvesting? Uh, and it can be, I, I understand, depends on returns. And, but uh, just a, a ballpark, what, what are we talking about out of the, you know, the 8,000 or so that are coming back? Do you have an idea? Chair Finley, Commissioners, uh, Director Melcher, for the record, my name's Dan Van Dyke. I'm the District Fish Biologist on the Rogue. Uh, and I can't answer specifically for you, uh, Commissioner Buckmaster, on that, that issue, other than the fact that uh, uh, it, it would be a sizable increase. And, and it's actually the nebulous nature of that that is one concern and one reason for caution uh, from my perspective when it comes to achieving desired status in the plan that includes uh, restoring that early run component of the Spring Chinook uh, run that was so important for the advisory committee. Well, they picked a month. Um, I mean, I, I had trouble with what felt like a, a counterintuitive uh, uh, proposal to start with. Uh, how can we increase, uh, um, uh, how, how can we make things better by harvesting more, uh, that was that was a tough one to get get past. But why did uh, I would like to have some sort of sense? We have some historic. Uh, we should have historic numbers of of what would be caught in that month uh, uh, as a percentage of the run, and we can base it on. So we could do something. Can you give me some sort of a? Uh, a sense. I mean, is it is it 500 fish? Is it a thousand fish? Uh, you know, is it 10 percent of the run we'd expect to, to harvest? Uh, Chair Finley, uh, Commissioner Buckmaster, we we could look at our punch card returns or the harvest card returns and see how many fish were harvested in a month. Um, we found uh, we we did change over those cards to allow for people to identify when they caught a wild fish by putting the W next to the, mm -hmm. to the species code. Um, we have found that that is not always completely accurate, so I don't know how good of an estimate we would get. Um, ideally, you have lots of years of that data, so you can kind of come up with an average. Unfortunately, um, the marking of, of the, and, and putting in that option of putting in the W uh, hasn't been in place for uh, I think 2005 or so was the first year we did that. So um, it would be kind of uh, uh, there would be large confidence intervals around what that estimate would be. 
we could, and, and that's one of the things we want to try to do is to try to understand, okay, what would be the impact if we were to propose this fishery? Keep in mind that the, that, that graph that I showed you was total spring Chinook. We have no way right now of knowing how many early run or mid run fish there are. So, so we might be able to tell you how many fish we think would get caught, but we're not going to be able to tell you what percent of the run would that be. Well, the one graph you showed us with uh, the hatchery fish, um, was that hatchery fish at the mouth or at, at the hatchery? Chair Finley, uh, Commissioner Buckmaster, that is solely returns to Cole Rivers. So that's after the, the fishery impacts all the way through the river from the mouth to River Mile 157 at Cole Rivers. So do you have numbers assuming uh, or some rough idea of what percentage of that uh, run was harvested from the mouth to two coal rivers? Uh, Chair Finley, Commissioner Buckmaster, uh, the, in the Spring Chinook plan, uh, there was uh, a thorough review of harvest levels using a lot of past information and, and harvest card information, and that was the reason for some of the restrictions on early run harvest. Right now we protect early run fish from any direct harvest. And there the idea was to try and keep the harvest rate below 40% impact rate uh, in the uh, uh, combined ocean and freshwater fishery. Um, the only data I have quickly, of course our data is, is still, we're working through that as part of our plan review. Um, I, I know I looked at some of the uh, hatchery harvest data uh, or the harvest punch card data that we have available through about 2015 and the harvest that is directed solely at hatchery fish has been about 3,500 on average for 2011 through 2015. How, how long have you been down there? I've been there probably 12 years, I think. Why wasn't there a five-year uh, assessment? What we did at the year five is we actually started annual uh, coordination meetings, information sharing meetings with our advisory committee at year five. I, don't, I, I won't speak for the other commissioners, but I received this information piecemeal. I received a petition. I received some things uh, uh, I have not seen. I do not have a copy of the, the uh, plan, the, uh, the, uh, and I'd like to see one. As I said, my initial sense of, of the petition was that it was uh, counterintuitive. Uh, I heard one of the su supporters say that uh, uh, we would have no idea if it was habitat or harvest, somewhat implying that uh, we weren't doing any habitat work. And, and that seems strange to me, but since I don't have a copy of the, the plan, I don't know if what habitat work has been done. Is there any? Chair Finley, Commissioner Buckmaster, there, there is. Uh, so in, I can answer in two ways. One, uh, one of the primary limiting factors that came out of the plan review, uh, a multi-year plan review, uh, was the impact of the operation of William Jess Dam on the wild spring Chinook, especially those early run uh, wild spring Chinook that are so, so treasured uh, by the communities. Um, we've done uh, quite a bit of work, in fact, uh, we have probably the best relationship with local core staff that we've had uh, in quite a while. And that, that dam, which actually has congressionally authorized instructions to manage for fish uh, has a, as a primary objective, uh, is operating the safest manner for, manner for Spring Chinook that it's been in virtually since the life of, of that dam. We have a really good working relationship and have weekly coordination meetings. Uh, and we're doing things to, uh, to minimize risk to the fish and trying new things uh, in, in the form of uh, making sure side channels, for instance, aren't dewatered during the fill season that, that kills eggs uh, and, and juveniles. We're also improving uh, work. We're working to improve fish production in Big Butte Creek uh, that uh, Steve Byerland mentioned. We are augmenting with gravel in Big Butte Creek actively. It's been a number of years since I've been at, at uh, Coal Rivers, but at, for many years it was one of my largest customers when we owned bioproducts. And uh, so we'd get down there on a regular basis. And, and uh, 
at the time they were producing about 1.7 million uh, Spring Chinook smolts. Uh, is that, where's that number now? Uh, Chair Finley, Commissioner Buckmaster, I reviewed as part of our review, and we did an intensive review of our hatchery program here over the last year or two, uh, because nobody's happy with where our hatchery run has been the last couple of years. Uh, I'm not aware we were ever at 7 million. 1.7. Oh, excuse me. We, we've been at 1.6 million for uh, probably 20 years. So it uh, hasn't changed that much. We just increased it uh, as part of the, the conservation plan. That was one of the actions in the plan. Uh, when our stray rates were acceptable, uh, we, we said we would increase production, and we have. Um, and, and as part of that increase, uh, we reinstituted a, a yearling release in March, and we just got the first four-year-old returns back from that yearling release, and it's very encouraging. Uh, and that's literally hot off the presses as of last week. Well, Chair Finley, I... I I still have, I, I still think if we're going to be looking at this seriously uh, uh, and looking at some significant changes to the plan uh, before we would vote on anything uh, like this petition, we need to be given more information. We need to see a copy of the plan. We need to be fully briefed on the plan. We need to be brought up to speed on what's going on. I certainly concur with Sarah Laborde uh, and Native Fish Society that we have a problem at that hatchery determining uh, hatchery performance by the number of smolts released as opposed to the number of adults returned has always been a, a sticking point for me. Uh, so uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm certainly think that we need to, to move forward on this plan and get some more information back. But uh, as far as moving on this petition, I'm going to have to, uh, uh, I will vote to reject it. Anything else, Commissioners? Commissioner Weber. I, <clears throat> Kevin or Dan, um, we're talking about this um, review that's coming up. Uh, is that going to happen this spring, next spring? You know, do we have some idea of when it's going to happen? There are a lot of people saying, geez, we've never had a review and we need to have one, and I just want to be sure it's going to happen soon. Yeah, Chair Finley, Commissioner Weber, it, it will happen in 2018, and, and our plan is we, we'd like to come out with something around March, at least as a draft. And um, <clears throat> in terms of the Rogue River, since this plan started, there's been a number of what I would think were pretty big changes with Savage Rapids, Gold Ray, um, the ideal diversion, Evans Creek dams removed, uh, and there's a lot of work there that uh, seems to me would have a positive effect that we haven't evaluated yet. Is that correct? Uh, Chair Finley, Commissioner Weber, uh, there, there's certainly a huge momentum for restoration in the Rogue Watershed, and I, I love being a part of that uh, momentum. And uh, I don't know that I would say uh, it, it hasn't been evaluated. We certainly did some actions uh, immediately post mainstem dam removal, uh, documenting that Chinook began spawning as soon as the dams in those reservoirs were, were out. Uh, and we did that for five years. Um, but it's, I think it's important to remember that the first, I, I consider 2011 to be the first brood year of fish, primarily Chinook, of course, that uh, experienced a river without those older main stem dams. So the first four-year-old returns post main stem dam removal is 2015. So we're just starting to get the returns. Um, and of course, they're, they're happening at a time where we're in seeing increasingly chaotic environmental conditions. So I, I really think it's going to be, you know, here in the next 20 years, uh, that's where we'll, we'll really know uh, the benefits and be able to measure uh, the benefits of, of things like the plan and, and those, those main stem dam removal projects through our existing monitoring programs uh, on the road. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, hang on a minute. There may be... 
one, one, one more. All right. So, commissioners, do I hear a motion? Do you want to discuss it among ourselves a few minutes? Well, I think we could discuss it, and <clears throat> I'm at the moment torn uh, because I tend to agree with Bruce, but then I'm kind of torn because if Richard Heap says to do something, I'm usually going to do it. <laughs> and and Richard's, <laughs> Rich said uh, that we should do this, and I just cannot see this close to this review of actually changing what we're doing to, which would make the review kind of moot to me. And I think we ought to go through the review process and see if this, um, you know, if, if staff thinks this would be a good idea after they complete the review. All right. I agree with that perspective. I can okay. agree with that perspective as well. All right. So having seen nodding heads, Commissioner Buckmaster, you want to make a motion? Uh, I move to deny the Curry Sport Fishing Association, Oregon South Coast Fishermen, and Tom Sather White petition and request the department to consider petitioners' request within the current conservation plan review process. I have a second. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Buckmaster and seconded by Commissioner Weber. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, it passes unanimously by the six commissioners present. Thank you all for all your good work. Tom, that included you and the thank you. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to Exhibit D. Vessel permit sale. Staff is Linda Lytle. Linda Lytle. Lytle? Lytle, you got it. Afternoon. We're all ears, so to speak. Okay. <laughs> Chair Finley, Director Melcher, Commissioners, I'm Linda Lytle. I'm the ODFW License Services Manager. The statement of rule for today for the vessel permit agenda item is in the event a, a buyer fails to complete a purchase agreement for a vessel permit, the seller is eligible for a temporary transfer of the vessel permit back to the seller if a preliminary injunction is issued by a circuit court. This would require ODFW and the Commercial Fishery Permit Board to allow the seller to continue to operate a vessel in the fishery during the pendency of the proceeding. Um, an order granting a preliminary injunction must include a finding that allowing the seller to continue to operate a vessel in the fishery would not cause excessive har harvest pressure on the resource. Any questions? pretty straightforward in the write-up and any question commissioners is there any no comments or no, there are no public, public comment no public. I have one question how how common has or what sort of frequency is this a problem no idea we're not involved in the legal proceedings between purchasers and, and sellers of permits we have no idea how many of these we could be dealing with I, I would add, uh, Chair Finley and Commissioner Weber, that there was one instance um, in the last several years that raised this issue and thus resulted in the passage of um, House Bill 2499. Yeah. Because I guess I, if it's pretty, you know, infrequently, I don't see a problem. If it's a frequent problem, then we're going to get drug into this presenting evidence on behalf of court orders. And I, it would just, you know, it create a problem. Yeah. So I we, guess I you we know, think we it's just it's very infrequent, but nonetheless, um, there was a, a case recently in the last several years that resulted in the House bill passage, and um, thus our rulemaking here with you today. Okay. 
I'll Any make other a motion questions? if there's no other? Sure, I'll, I'll accept okay. the motion. I'll read all these numbers. Here we go. <laughs> I move to adopt OAR 635 0 0 0 0 0 and 635-006-1095 as proposed by staff. What was the that. third one? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've, 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 we've got uh, a motion by Commissioner Anderson and a second by Commissioner Akinson. Any further discussion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Hearing none, it passes unanimously by the six commissioners present. Thank you very much. Linda. Okay, exhibit E. Kevin, come on up. I saw you walk in. Let's do some uh, restoration and enhancement project approvals and board appointments. Good afternoon, Chair Finley, Commissioners, Director Melcher. For the record, my name is Kevin Herkamp. I'm the Restoration Enhancement Program and Salmon Trout Enhancement Program Coordinator for the Department. Today, I will be presenting two R&E related issues and one step related issue uh, for your consideration and action. The first issue I will be presenting um, is the need to appoint a new sport fishing representative and seafood processing representative to the R&E Board. RE board members are appointed by the commission, and each board member has the opportunity to serve two four year terms. Per statute, our current board members include three commercial representatives and three sport fishing representatives, as well as a public at large representative. Bob Bemstead has uh, run his eight year course, and his term is expiring the end of this month, and we will be needing to replace that. And the seafood processing position was vacated here couple months ago when uh, our current the current uh, member moved out of state ODFW advertised the vacancies through various media sources and organizations we received seven applications from across the state for the sport fishing position and one application for the seafood processing position uh, candidates were evaluated based on the criteria you see on the screen after reviewing the applications, internally two sport candidates uh, and one commercial candidate were selected for interviews. And interviews were conducted by three staff members and the current Arnie board chair. Based on the review, staff recommends the appointment of Dave Grojak from Grants Pass to be appointed as a sport fishing representative and Susan Chambers from Coos Bay be appointed as the seafood processing representative. As you'll also note in the packet, uh, we did have an alternate of Randy Smith from Coos Bay as the um, alternate for sport fishing. I would like to point out that Dave is in the audience today. Uh, Susan may, uh, may or may not be. She was running late from a uh, um, doctor's appointment in Eugene, and um, she wanted to be here, though. So with that, I would uh, welcome if you wanted to ask any questions of the, of the candidates or of myself before we move on to the next issue. Let's see, do we have any public testimony? No. Okay. All right, commissioners, no public testimony. So if you have any questions. He's got projects too, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I was going to do it. <coughs> you want to do hop the. Yeah, let's do one at a time. I would uh, move that. Um, Appoint uh, Dave, Groshek. Dave Groshek, yeah um, to a four-year term as the sport fishing representative and Susan Chambers to a four-year term as the seafood processing representative on the Fish Restoration and Enhancement Board. Okay. I second that. Okay. It's been moved by Commissioner Weber and seconded by Commissioner Akinson. Uh, any further comments or questions or discussion? 
Hearing none, I'll ask for a vote. Call the question here. Those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, it passes unanimously by the six commissioners present. Okay, let's move on to project approvals. All right. The second issue we'll be presenting is the Arnie projects from cycle three of the 1719 biennium for your review and approval. At their meeting in Medford on September 8th, the board uh, recommended four enhancement projects uh, for your review. The recommendations totaled about 274,000, as you can see on the screen as outlined in your packet. Just to provide an example of one of the projects that's in front of you today is a, a new, new fishing dock out at Cape Mears. Uh, basically this site is heavily used by kids on bikes and other uh, members of the public and as you see the parking's pretty limited out there and people are fishing out of the right of way. Uh, the idea will be to add a T dock out off of one of the areas that has a little better parking and try to, uh, try to make it a little bit more conducive to the public using it. The recommendations to total for cycle three is just over 274,000. If these projects are approved uh, by the commission day, just under about 250,000 uh, will remain or about 5% of the estimated revenue for the rest of the biennium. r &E staff recommends that the commission approve the recommended projects presented to you today. And that concludes issue number two. I'd be willing to take any questions. Commissioner Woolley. Thank you. I have a question about the Bowman Pond project. So where and how are the uh, sediments being disposed? Chair Finley, Commissioner Willie, that was a question that the Ernie Board had as well. Um, the applicant did answer some of it. They're, they're looking at that. It is up, most of its upstream sedimentation. Uh, the pond was last dredged, I think, 20 or 25 years ago, uh, and, and that has just slowly um, come in from the water source, basically, as well as... Uh, um, normal just pond sedimentation from the aquatic vegetation and other nutrients that are deposited. So, yeah, I'm talking about disposable post oh, excavation. Post. Sorry. W where, are you where are you depositing the, the sediments? I do not recall that how the applicant had, had described that. Uh, I believe talking with the district, they do have property on site that they can they can haul that material off and dispose of it in upland locations. And that would be a re that would be a requirement for us, and that is something we do look at. So it will be an on-site. I believe so. I believe that is the uh, proposal. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All right. I'm looking for a motion. I, I have one question. Okay. What happens? Uh, maybe either. You or the director can answer. What happens to remaining funds, the 5% as we go into the next biennium? Uh, are those rolled? We lose them? Um, Chair Finley and Commissioner Buckmaster, no, those, those funds remain. They're basically considered a dedicated and obligated uh, fund balance that remains in that account, in that dedicated account, crossing biennium. Thank you. Chair Finley, Commissioner Buckmaster, I'd also like to add, this is the third cycle. We still have basically seven cycles during the, um, during the biennium, so we do, uh, we are set up for the next cycle and actually have more requests than we do have funds coming into this, the next cycle. So uh, this will be probably one of the first biennium where we have actually spent down um, everything in our account earlier on, and that's part of the board's uh, new priority to try to to move that more money more toward the beginning of the biennium and be proactive in getting that funding out uh, versus holding on to the end when projects just, you're not able to spend the money on the large projects. Okay. Looking for a motion? I would move to approve the recommendations of the Fish Restoration and Enhancement Board. I second. Okay, it's been moved by Commissioner Weber and seconded by Commissioner Woolley. Any uh, further discussions, questions? Hearing or seeing none, call the question. All those uh, in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, passes unanimously of the six commissioners present. Thank you very much, Kevin. All right, and I have my third issue here. Yeah. 
Well, that's right. You yeah. do. All right. Sorry. So I'll now be presenting a recommendation to adjust the step advisory committee boundaries for your review and approval. Uh, the step advisory committee is composed of 13 members from across the state as shown on the map. Members represent the local step volunteers and advise the department on concerning the implementa implementation of step. Over the past several decades, uh, volunteer trends have changed and the current distribution um, no longer provides the best representatives or best representation for most of the groups and the volunteers. Uh, we currently have locations like the Upper Umpqua that have been underrepresented in areas like the North Coast that have been overrepresented. The current territories are based primarily on the ODFW district boundaries and do not necessarily ref reflect the population centers or geopolitical boundaries and can be confusing to volunteers. Staff, after, after consulting with Stack at their public uh, meetings, recommend that we move one of the North Coast representatives to the Upper Umpqua and adjust the adjoining boundaries to better represent the groups and align closer to the ge geopolitical boundaries. Uh, to describe these, the first one is to um, combine the Lower Umpqua and Mid Coast into one area with a Southern and a Northern representative. Um, and to adjust the middle and south Willamette boundaries to better reflect the population centers. Uh, currently in Eugene, we have three district boundaries that come together uh, fairly close, and uh, we have three stack representatives, sometimes can be an hour and a half or two hours away, uh, and, and we're, while we have one uh, stack representative in Eugene, so this should make it a little bit smoother for them to uh, know who they get to, to work with. Um, so this concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions on this. Questions? Comments? Question. Just, um, so this proposal to change boundaries, where did that originate from or when? So it has been a dialogue that we've kind of had off and on with the, with the stack members. Uh, we've had a hard time filling the North Coast representative, the, the Northern North Coast representative and keeping um, individuals in that position. And that primarily has to, uh, it was a result of not having really any groups up there. We have two schools. Uh, Astoria High School and Warrington High School is our main step focus on the far north coast. Most of the step work is actually around Tillamook and uh, Hebo area. Uh, so it has been fairly difficult to get the qualified or, or really engaged individuals up there. And then also the Umqua, we have a very large group down there and we've the individual that is currently representing them is out of Florence and uh, has basically said I, it's very difficult to make it up there and represent those individuals on a routine basis and so we started having that that dialogue and this was the result of, of probably a couple of years of thinking about it and then we had several vacancies come up all at once and this seemed like the good time to, to take advantage of that. So just wanna, when you say when you refer to we do you mean we at the department or we as the staff advisory committee? Um, Chair Finley and Commissioner Anderson, a, a little bit of both. Um, I, was, I did bring it up to the advisory committee about some options that were out there and the dialogue did develop between both the board and myself. Um, so it was, it was really a mutual discussion. Okay. Okay. Looking for a motion. Mm -hmm. I'll make one. Oh. Okay. I move to approve the recommendations to adjust the stack territories. Okay. Second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved by... <laughs> Greg, I'm, I'm appreciating that you made that motion. I, I can tell. I don't know what's going <laughs> I appreciate your appreciation. <laughs> it's been moved by Commissioner Woolley and seconded by Commissioner Anderson. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Or nay, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Would be the correct answer. All right, so uh, the motion carries five to one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Be true to your school. <laughs> okay, next is Exhibit F, Recreational Commercial Groundfish Regulations and Commercial Shark and Swordfish Conversion Factors. Maggie, Summer.
morning, afternoon. <laughs> Still in wishful thinking that it was morning. No, Good afternoon, <laughs> Chair Finley and Commissioners, Director Melcher. Uh, Maggie Summer, Marine Fishery Management Section Leader with the Marine Resources Program. Here with your annual exhibit uh, with a nearshore logbook report from our commercial nearshore fishery as required by statute. And then uh, several decision-making items on commercial and recreational ground fish regulations for your consideration. To start with, uh, my nearshore logbook report today will be brief, but I want to remind everyone that we produce an annual summary report of this fishery, which includes quite a bit of detail. It's on uh, uh, our website at the address at the bottom of the slide, and it includes information from both the logbooks and other sources. This logbook report focuses on 2016, the last full year for which we have data. Participants in this fishery have a state-issued limited entry black and blue rockfish permit, some of which have an additional endorsement allowing harvest of other nearshore species. This graph shows the number of permits by port or port group along the coast, and the fishery has been stable in terms of numbers and geographic distribution in recent years. Here's another way to visualize where the activity in this fishery occurs. This set of maps with a north coast on the left and the south on the right shows the location of 2016 catch of all species combined from the nearshore logbooks. Logbooks provide at sea information on fishing location, depth, gear types used, numbers and species of fish released or discarded, etc., which is valuable for stock assessment and other purposes. Logbooks are just one of many sources of information about our intensively monitored and managed, managed commercial fisheries. Other sources include fish tickets, which document 100% of landings, at sea federal observers, biological and other data, and samples collected at the dock by our own biologists. On this slide, in the ticket pounds column, we see the total amount landed in this fishery from our fish ticket data set. This is all species combined. This amount's been pretty stable over time. Fishermen are required to submit a logbook for each trip, and the column labeled submissions show the number we received. The compliance column shows the total proportion of trips for which logbooks were received. Moving on to the 2018 groundfish fishery regulations, we have several topics, starting with annual quotas for both commercial and recreational fisheries, then nearshore commercial trip limits, and the dressed weight conversion factors for sharks and swordfish, uh, I'll note this is the last item in your agenda item summary, but I will cover it earlier here in order to leave the recreational bottom fish fishery for last in my presentation, since that's the more complex item in this presentation. So to set the stage for how much fish we're talking about for next year, uh, again, for both our commercial and recreational fisheries, as a reminder, annual quotas are set for each species for Oregon by the Pacific Fishery Management Council and the National Marine Fisheries Service every two years based on the most recent stock assessment. At this level, these quotas cover all mortality from commercial and recreational fisheries, including both landed catch and the portion of released or discarded catch that dies. 2018 is the second year of the Federal Fishery Management Biennium, so the federal quotas for 2018 have been in federal rule since last year and were already adopted in state rule by reference to the federal ground fish fishery rules. The commission establishes annual harvest guidelines for commercial and recreational fisheries in Oregon by allocating the total federal quotas to each sector. The allocation proportions have been consistent since the early 2000s with only minor adjustments in response to revisions in accounting for various species and fisheries and staff are not recommending any changes for next year. Here are the actual numbers in metric tons for the total federal quotas for 2018 compared to recent years. This is from table two in your agenda item summary. And again, we previewed these last year, so there are no surprises here. One item to note is the decline in the black rockfish quota of about 10% from 2016 to 17 based on the 2015 stock assessment for Oregon black rockfish. There's a much smaller scheduled decline in the black rockfish quota this year, which will continue to occur in future years until a new black rockfish stock assessment is conducted. 
This is table three, three in your agenda item summary, which shows what the federal limits translate to as harvest guidelines for our commercial and recreational fisheries when the allocation proportions shown in parentheses on the left are applied. I want to note uh, a correction to the printed version of the slides and the printed agenda item summary. It's correct on screen, but under nearshore rockfish, the proportions in parentheses were reversed. Uh, so the, the correct proportions are as shown on screen right now, 28.2% to commercial, 71.8% recreational. And as I mentioned, we are not proposing any change to the allocation proportions that have been in place for a number of years. This is also a good place to note that establishing separate sector harvest guidelines allows us to develop independent management measures for each fishery and manage that fishery to its own harvest guideline in season based on what's happening in this fishery. This is why you might see the fishery specific catch controls such as recreational daily bag limits and commercial two month trip limits going in different directions at the same time. The staff recommendation here is to adopt the 2018 state harvest guidelines shown on the right side of this slide and in your reference materials. Moving on to the commercial nearshore fishery, uh, 2018 rules, your action is to adopt cumulative trip limits for two month periods. Trip limits are the in season control mechanism for this commercial fishery and they help extend the season to the desired length by modulating the rate at which the fishery approaches its annual harvest guideline. At our public meetings with nearshore fishermen and fish buyers this fall, we heard a message consistent with what we've heard in past years, which is that a stable and predictable season is important for planning their businesses. A year round season is desired. And then this year we heard some requests for small trip limit increases for several stocks at some times of the year to address market needs. This graph shows fleet-wide attainment of the commercial annual harvest guidelines, uh, which can give you an idea of how well the trip limits achieved that goal of providing opportunity for the fishery. Yeah, in attainment in 2017, which is the darkest bars on this graph, uh, is strong for black rockfish, cabazon, uh, and blue deacon and the other nearshore rockfish through mid-November. One minor point to note is that greenling attainment appears to have dropped significantly on this graph, but that's because of the very large increase in quota uh, between 2016 and 17 that resulted, again, from the 2015 kelp greenling stock assessment. The actual poundage landed in 2017 is, is a slight increase so far from 2016. This brings us to the staff recommendation for 2018 trip limits for the commercial nearshore fishery, which are in the right-hand column uh, on this slide. And again, they're also in your reference materials. These are in line with public input we received from fishery participants. One final commercial fishery item unrelated to our commercial nearshore ground fish fishery is the conversion factors for sharks and swordfish. These factors, which allow estimation of total round weight when the fish are landed dressed, have been established uh, and published in other sources. Immediate dressing or cleaning of the fish is important to maintain product quality for shark and swordfish species, which are allowed to be landed, pardon me, landed and sold. Sharks and swordfish are managed under federal fishery management plans, and the conversion factors would have no impact on harvest regulations or levels. The staff recommendation is to adopt these conversion factors into permanent rule. Moving to the recreational ground fish fishery, I'll cover several topics ordered here from least to most complex, and I'll focus most of this portion of the presentation on a discussion of bag limits, season structure, and risk for next year. We'll start with uh, one of the more straightforward items, which is a recommendation on descending devices. Recall that beginning this year, all vessels fishing for bottom fish or halibut are required to have a functional descending device on board, and anglers must use a device when releasing any rockfish greater than uh, it, releasing any rockfish outside of the 30 fathom management line. We've seen a very high reported rate of use when it's required this year, over 90 percent. There has been some public interest in expanding the use requirement inshore of 30 fathoms to provide additional benefits to released fish. However, as you move inshore, the potential benefits decrease relative to the costs. 
As you move shallower, fewer fish require assistance get to get back down to depth after release, but at the same time, the additional handling and time on deck can significantly decrease a fish's survival. Uh, ideally, we'd like all anglers to use a descending device whenever it's needed, um, and we believe that the, the best approach to this is education and voluntary use inshore of 30 fathoms. We're also pleased with a high rate of self-reported compliance so far. Therefore, our recommendation is to leave the rule unchanged, and we'll continue to work with the public on recognizing when fish need help returning to depth and on proper handling and the importance of getting them back in the water as soon as possible. Pardon me, should have put that up there a moment ago. So with this slide, uh, I'm going to move into looking at how the 2017 recreational bottom fish fishery went in order to frame the discussion on changes for 2018. Overall, effort was uh, a record high this year, but it was close to 2015. The solid purple line is the cumulative effort, uh, uh, cumulative 2017 effort in terms of the number of all bottom fish angler trips, and the orange dash line is 2015. The big story here is the large increase in effort uh, from not that long ago. The blue dotted line, which is the lowest one on this graph, represents the uh, average effort over the five-year period from 2010 to 2014, and you can see how much higher we are now. The final full-year effort in 2015, which we were on track to exceed slightly this year, was 50% greater than that average, so that significant jump uh, at this point seems to be perhaps more than just a one-year outlier. And we'll keep this in mind for the discussion on bag limits and season length in a few limits, uh, pardon me, in a few minutes. The quota for this year, this fishery's mainstay isn't getting any bigger, but since there are more people wanting a slice of that pie, it becomes more challenging to make it last all year. One other thing to note, in addition to what you can see easily in this graph, is that the month of August was very different in 2017 than it was even in 2015 or other past years. We had, a, an, again, a 50% increase in uh, the number of bottom fish angler trips in just the month of August this year over the month of August in prior years, uh, including that, uh, the uh, previous high of 2015. And in terms of numbers, this year we had uh, about 25,500 trips in August compared to 16,500 trips in each of 2015 and 2016 Augusts. Great ocean conditions much of the summer, poor salmon fishing, a lot of people on the coast escaping hot, smoky conditions inland, and the lack of tuna within recreational fishing range off our coast in August when it's usually a very big draw led a lot more people uh, to fishing for bottom fish. One final thing that could potentially have mitigated the impacts somewhat to nearshore species like black rockfish this year is the summer long leader fishery we've been talking to you about uh, for a, a couple years now. We're waiting for the National Marine Fishery Service to authorize it outside of 40 fathoms in the summer in federal rule. We did expect that by April this year, but it's still delayed. The extremely high effort and catch were good news in terms of the excellent fishing enjoyed by a lot of people this summer, but it led to an early season closure. We have preliminary catch estimates available for staff review approximately one week after the end of each month, and in early September it was apparent that we had already or were about to reach the recreational harvest guidelines for not just black rockfish, but also minor nearshore rockfish, yellow eye rockfish, and cabazon. We closed the fishery on September 18th, allowing it to remain open for one more weekend after we announced the closure in order to allow trips already planned uh, to occur during that time period. This closed the primary bottom fish fishery, although we did leave open fishing for flatfish since there is little bycatch of rockfish or other species when targeting flatfish, as well as spearfishing for lingcod since there's no bycatch when you are visually identifying the fish before you spear it. Finally, we did make a big effort to get the word out uh, about the rockfish closure and what was still open, which at the time also included nearshore halibut, crab, and chinook, uh, nearshore halibut on most of the coast, crab and chinook salmon fishing in addition to those listed here. 
As a brief aside, one question that has come up frequently and I want to uh, just take a moment to address here is why we didn't lower the bag limit earlier in the season in order to prevent or delay a closure. And the answer is that um, the unforeseen effort spike in August. When we reviewed catch estimates in early August, when we were looking at data through July, we could tell that we were tracking high and a bag limit change would be needed to make it through the year. However, based on modeling we had uh, at that time, it looked like either of two options would keep us under the annual harvest guideline. Reducing the bag limit from seven to four fish immediately in mid-August, uh, or reducing the bag limit to three fish after Labor Day. Both of those changes would have been a significant drop in the bag limit. We've heard a very uh, consistent message from the public in prior years uh, that the summer is very important, Labor Day is very important, get through Labor Day and ideally not make a disruptive change right before then. Waiting until after Labor Day to make a bag limit reduction seemed the better choice to us. Unfortunately, as it turned out, oh, pardon me, Uh, tuna didn't show up in August. Excellent weather conditions remained. It was hotter and smokier in the valley. Um, and there was, there was really, as I mentioned, extreme levels of effort in August. Uh, so it, it worked against us in hindsight. Um, I will say overall this has certainly informed our understanding of the variability and risk in this fishery, which I'll speak to a little bit later in this presentation. So after the closure, we were left with some very abundant species that we are not quota limited on, such as midwater rockfish like yellowtail and widow. We designed a limited reopening to provide some opportunity to catch those fish. Given that we needed to avoid black and other nearshore rockfish, which are found inshore, as well as yellow eye rockfish, which are also found offshore, this was an exercise in threading the needle to design a fishery that did not add to catch of those over quota stocks. The answer was to open for rockfish fishing only outside 40 fathoms, since encounters with black and other nearshore rockfish are infrequent at that depth, and to require the use of long leader gear, which catches midwater rockfish with very low bycatch, pardon me, of yellow eye rockfish and other benthic species. We raised the bag limit to 10 fish, which is the maximum allowed under current federal regulations in order to increase the opportunity for those midwater species and to make these longer trips more attractive. Lingcod was a big disappointment this fall. Offshore lingcod fishing is very popular when the bottom fish fishery opens up to all depths on October 1st, but lingcod fishing also brings bycatch of yellow eye rockfish. Unfortunately, despite obtaining approval from the Pacific Fishery Management Council in September to take a small amount more uh, of yellow eye this fall, when we reviewed catch estimates prior to reopening, so many more yellow eye had been caught in the time uh, leading up to the closure that the extra amount had almost been used up already. So we were um, uh, left, we closed Lingcod in order to avoid any further catch of yellow eye rockfish. 